Change in any society starts with small groups of people. It could be that they don't have any impact in the future, but I think the fact that they exist, to me, is important enough to want to document. So my name is Ian Johnson. I'm currently a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a freelance writer. And I was in China for 20 years, starting in the 1980s, and especially throughout the whole 2010s, uh, when I researched this book called Sparks, which is on unofficial or underground historians. In Chinese, the term Minjian might be better. It describes people who challenge the CCP's monopoly on talking about the past. The people I write about in the book are people who, by and large, maybe with one or two exceptions, are still active in China today. I guess what struck me in talking to these people is that, just like probably all of us, we're motivated often by things that we first encounter that has some personal effect on us. So for people who are now quite old, it might have been that they experienced firsthand the Great Famine, or maybe they went through the Cultural Revolution, or they experienced Tiananmen, or for younger people, they went through the COVID lockdowns. At that point, the people begin to think, oh, the history that I learned in school is not exactly the full story. And then another thing I think is just a universal idea to me, at least of justice or righteousness. And you see this in all societies, right? People who, for whatever reason, feel a need to stand up and speak truth to power. So starting about 25 years ago, with basic digital technologies, especially the PDF and digital cameras, it made it possible for people to rediscover banned books, banned magazines that the government thought it had erased, or which were only existed in just a few copies here and there. And then through PDFs, they could recreate these books, they could recirculate them among people in China. So that's sort of the story of the title of the book, Sparks, which refers to a magazine that was created in 1960 in Gansu province, was completely confiscated by the government, vanished, but then because of PDFs, it was revived and people could read it again and it began to circulate like wildfire inside China. Yes, so last summer I set up something called the China Unofficial Archive, which in Chinese is Minjian uh, Dang Anguan. The archive is meant to be a platform for all of these works by independent historians in China. So these are books, uh, magazines, and independent films, documentary films. You can search the archive by era, by the creator. Sort of a nonpartisan. we're not endorsing these books. These books have very different points of view, etc. We're just like a library. We're just making this available. Because I think one of the problems is that it's hard to know where to get all this information like, and all of these books and so on, especially with Hong Kong being closed down as a source for some of this. We felt it was necessary to give some sort of a home for all of this material. One of the very first talks I gave was at the Harvard bookstore and there were a lot of young Chinese people, you know, students in the audience, and I wondered, oh, I wonder if some of these people are going to be nationalistic <laughs> and, and be against what I was talking about. But on the contrary, everybody came up afterwards and said, oh, come with us. We have this democracy salon and we want you to sit in and chat with us about all of these issues. And so I found that actually really quite moving. And I think there's a popular idea that the government has completely whitewashed the past and that amnesia rules in China. And while that's probably true for a lot of people, I think it's important to show that um, not all Chinese people are, are like that or have bought into the system, and that there's still people in this very trying time today who are making efforts to challenge the CCP. And maybe for some people that's um, a, a good feeling to, to, to have that described.